So Russia has been invaded 50 odd time, invaded 50 odd times in its history. And all of the invasions have come through one of nine of what I call gateway territories that link the former Soviet space to the rest of the world. The Polish gap, the Bessarabian gap, those are two of the biggest ones. And they are unfortunately for the Ukrainians uh, on the far side of Ukraine from Russia. So per Putin's end goal here is to plug all nine of these gaps. Now, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the Russians went from controlling all nine to just one. And bit by bit with the Kazakh conflict, with Nagorno-Karabakh, with the Georgia war, with the Crimean war, uh, they've added bits and pieces back to plugging those gateways. And if they get Ukraine in its totality, they will have merely plugged another two. Now, that does mean that Ukraine is not the end of the story. It's just the middle of the story. There, there's another war after this one. Sure. So the geography explains the why. Uh, the why now is demographics. Uh, the Russians, well, I don't know if you've ever been to Russia, the, the, the climate is awful. Uh, and it's very difficult uh, in a modern society to function because you don't have rivers going the right directions. Uh, the, the winters are long and they're harsh. And so civilization in the way that we think of it is very expensive and they don't have any natural ways to generate capital on their own. So it's always been a very brute force approach and it took Stalin to industrialize what was then the Soviet Union. Uh, but that has a consequence. As you put, move people off of the farms and into cities, uh, kids go from being free labor to just being mobile, loud, expensive pieces of furniture. And you have less of them because adults can do math. So Russia in two generations went from having seven children per family to now under two. And that was before the bottom fell out in the post-Soviet collapse. And they're now down about 1.4. The generation that collapsed in the 1990s is now so small that when it's their turn to have kids, there's not a whole lot that can happen. So this is kind of the last year that the Russians have a large enough cadre of people in their 20s to have a draft-based military. You wait any longer than this, and the, the Russians are going to have difficulties patrolling their own internal territories, much less fighting off an internal, external aggressor. So while no one's expecting a war in the short term of somebody invading Russia, the Russians know that if they don't do this now, that no matter what the power balances are in the future, they will always be on the losing side. Russia's never been like that. Russia borders a dozen different countries, all of which have taken a crack at Russia at some point in the past. And hypersonics sound great until you realize that unless you put a nuke on the end of that, all you've done is blown up a building. And it's a very expensive way to blow up a building. So hypersonics really serve very little purpose in a conventional war. Jets do, and Russia's military reflects that. When you've got a large chunk of territory and you expect to be the defender, you have bottomless supplies of cheap disposable missile or a cheap disposable jets. Uh, and to this point, there's no one on their borders who can match that. But the Germans are no slacks. Uh, the, the, the Swedes always punch above their weight. Uh, the Poles have a historical grudge to bear. The Iranians and the Turks have never been Russian friends. Uh, the Chinese almost got in a nuclear war with the Japanese in the past, and the Russians are still smarting over their war with Tokyo back in 1905. So from the Russian point of view, there is no horizon that is safe. And the hypersonics just aren't the weapon systems to balance that. The only reason that the Russians have done hypersonics is their logic is if it works, if, mm -hmm. then we have the ability to strike uh, the, the North American econ continent in a very short period of time. Um, I would argue, though, that what we've seen out of the Russian systems does not look all that promising uh, for no other reason than uh, either the Trump or the Biden administrations hasn't pushed for a new round of nuclear arms talks. Uh, because as soon as they started want, working on hypersonics, we started working on mm -hmm. hypersonics. And that was a program here that we shelved in the 70s. So it was very easy for us to get that back up and running again, whereas they were doing it from scratch. And if something is going to change the strategic balance that extremely, and the Russians know they can't keep up in the financial fight, you know they're going to be screaming for arms control because that's the only way they can achieve parity. There's a large history of corruption throughout the Russian system, the military included, but we thought, and when I say we, I mean everyone who's ever studied Russia in the last 30 years, we thought they learned all those lessons after Grozny. We thought they learned them after the Second Chechen War, because by the end of the Second Chechen War in 2001, they weren't doing this anymore. But here we are 20 years later, and despite a couple significant international deployments, and all of a sudden it feels like we're back in 1993.
the, Ru- the Russians are going to still win despite all of this. They outnumber the Ukrainians. They've got better equipment. They've got shorter supply lines. They don't have to worry about controlling their borders in order to keep the resources coming. They can suck up a huge amount of casualties and Russian society will not rebel. Remember, it wasn't until you had almost a million dead in World War One that we had any inkling of political problems back in Russia. We're nowhere close to that. And a lot of Russians agree with what Putin is doing, either for nationalist regions or for strategic reasons. So uh, these reports that we do see about uh, people fleeing Russia, they are true. There are dissidents. They are not going to win. So far, all of the protests combined, still talking less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. That doesn't move the needle in a dictatorship. And so Russia is going to win this, and then they're going to have to pacify the country. And the question is, what level of internal violence and sabotage are they willing to tolerate in order to move on to the next stage of the war? And that's where things get interesting from the NATO point of view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's there's one thing that was coloring American decision-making on all things Russian, it's that they were maybe not a peer force, but a near peer force. And we would have to be very careful how we operated. We would have to be at the top of our game if we weren't going to have horrendous casualties. All of a sudden, that logic's gone out the window. And we now know that if American forces and Russian forces meet on the field of battle, the Russian forces will be obliterated. And if that happens, the only thing the Russians, the only choice the Russians have is between a humiliating strategic withdrawal to do whatever the Americans say or up the ante with nukes. And so from the American, from the White House, from the DOD's point of view, this has gotten a lot scarier than we ever thought it would be. Because all of a sudden, if we can't keep Russia locked down in Ukraine, if we can't bleed them there till they die, if we can't make it out of their reach so that they can then go on and do the next series of targets, then there will be a direct American-Russian confrontation that we can't avoid because these are NATO allies. So the NATO strategy, the White House strategy now is to ship every piece of military equipment that we can that doesn't require a static physical resupply or launching point like a plane. So drones are good. Anti-tank missiles are good. Stingers are good. Anything like that's great. Send it all. Because as long as Russia is bogged down in a bloodbath in Ukraine, they can't go to the next step. And that's where the American troops are. We have to prevent that from happening. It's the same basic concept as what's going on with the military and the economy. You know, the, the last group of people who have the full suite of training uh, were trained in the mid-1980s. In the case of uh, the leadership specifically, we're talking about all people from the KGB. Uh, when Yuri Andropov took over in the early 1980s, it was a bit of an internal coup in that we had uh, one faction that used to be part of the government take over the government because they thought that the previous, well, these people stayed in, I wouldn't even call it the background. They weren't officially in charge, but they were always large and present in the 1990s. And when Yeltsin took ill, they're the ones who took over from Yeltsin. So we had a a quick revolution, lasted a few years, then Yeltsin got uh, dropped because his health health was atrocious. Uh, And the KGB has been in the FSB, the KGB's successor, the FSB, has been in charge of ever since. 